Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sug Moni. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, HD voice, high definition voice, uh, the overdue revolution. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about what HD voice is, um, how will you make HD voice happen on today's networks, uh, who is doing HD voice, get into some very interesting questions here, um, and where you can find uh, HD voice, high definition voice. Uh, eh, don't need that. Okay. Uh, back in 2009, there were a bunch of events that took place that were kind of like a wake-up call um, for me and some other folks about um, delivering high-quality voice. Um, first of all, France Telecom uh, started beating its drum. Um, they have over 5,000 uh, G722 uh, VoIP endpoints, uh, wideband endpoints deployed. Um, in addition to that, they, they turned up um, uh, HD voice in Moldova. And why would you pick Moldova to demonstrate a bleeding-edge technology? Well, okay, maybe that's a self-answering question. Um, Global Crossing, um, it very quietly built a, a conferencing bridge um, to support HD for its customers, um, for, excuse me, for a customer, and it's working on a product for a, uh, an open HD voice conferencing bridge where anybody can just call in and, and uh, do a conference call on HD. Uh, Verizon Business um, has close to 5,000 uh, HD voice phones, specifically Polycom phones, if there are any Polycom fans in the audience. Um, installed at their headquarters in Basking Ridge. Um, Verizon expects their early adopters to come by um, later half of this year and have general availability of HD um, on Verizon's business network, not to be confused with Fios or, or their wireless network, um, in 2011. And then uh, Cablevision uh, deployed a hosted HD voice service in the second half of 2009. Um, so we're left with this quandary, um, either A, once again, the United States of America is being outclassed by the rest of the world in, in telecommunications technology, how many of you think that? Or the other half, U.S. carriers are going to wait until the smoke clears and then get a deal done uh, because somebody else has done the hard R&D. Uh, hard to say with some of these carriers. Uh, first, what is narrowband voice or, or what does it mean? Um, Narrowband voice is basically what you get on nearly every POTS, uh, plain old telephone system, uh, wired or wireless call today around the world. And I'm going to ignore ISDN and the mobile HD uh, voice deployments for a moment. Uh, a PSTN grade call um, captures voice in about a 3.4 kilohertz range, 300 hertz to about 3,400 hertz. Um, so what happens is you're, you're, you're uh, hearing of a human, um, what that, that 3, 4, Basically, you get about a third delivered on an, on an average phone of what you can actually hear. Now, that acoustical standard was set back in 1937. And since then, we've had FM radio, television, CDs, DVDs, HDTV, HD radio. We've had all these audio advances. But the fundamental phone system around the world has not changed since 1937 from an acoustical standpoint. There are a couple of exceptions. We're going to ignore them right now. Um, now, the VoIP equivalent, the voice over IP equivalent of narrowband is uh, G711, and it delivers that uh, 3.4 kilohertz of sound at about 64 kilobits of bandwidth. Um, now, if you think about it, let me stop for a minute. Landline phone has otherwise, every other technology in landline phone has changed since 1937. The user interface has changed, the way you connect calls has changed, the network has all changed. Um, you know, if you just pick up your phone, you know, back in 1937, they had a dial on it. Um, you had pulse dialing, you had a cord in the wall that was wired into the wall. Um, you walk into any home today and it's like, you know, unless you're a member of the professionally paranoid, you don't have a cord corded phone in your house. You have a cordless phone and it's got buttons on it and it plugs into an RJ11 jack in the wall. Okay, so what is HD voice as I set that up? Uh, HD voice is also called wideband voice. Now, um, what it, that means is that it delivers voice in a range of at least 7 kilohertz, in other words, twice that of um, a narrowband call. Or if I do my Tom Cruise imitation, this is you on uh, narrowband, this is you on HD. Narrowband, HD. Um, the, if, if, if we turn to the um, how that's delivered in uh, voice over IP, the, the G722 codec is basically the standard or baseline when people start talking about HD voice and it captures a sound in a range of 30 hertz to 7,000 hertz. Um, but interestingly enough, um, you still only need that 64 uh, kilobits per second of bandwidth just due to the, the, the rather um, mellow amount of compression that uh, G722 does. 
Um, other HD voice codecs that we'll get to a little bit later include uh, something called AMR Wideband. Silk is pretty popular um, among the Skype crowd. And then there's a, another Kodak called uh, ISAC uh, that's made by a Git. Um, one of the key takeaways here is HD voice is only delivered on a, a digital network or an IP network that the current phone system, POTS phone system, just can't handle it because it's all analog. And, and all the handsets are legacy and they don't know, you know, you can't talk codecs to, to uh, an RJ11 phone. The sidebar, um, there's a lot of hype coming out about super wideband or codecs that sample nearly the, the full range of human speech. Now, um, uh, I, I know I'm mixing and matching some of my terms here, but um, typically uh, the sampling um, is 8 kilohertz sampling for narrowband, 16 for wideband, 24 hertz for super wideband. Beyond that, you're sampling for your dog to hear it. Um, uh, super wideband in some cases is basically marketing speak for we're better than G722 in a lot of cases. Um, but on the other hand, is in, as we'll hear in the demo, um, super wideband comes as close as you can get for delivering you know, true voice, just like you and I sitting across and talking to each other. Um, looking at the, the stuff from a different perspective, when you start talking about hertz, this is probably the best visual representation. First column is your voice, uh, basically more or less what it looks like in, in hertz. Human hearing, more or less of the, the amount that you can hear in terms of hertz. Uh, Narrowband call, that is that little dinky bar right there in the middle. Then you go to HD voice, the bar next to it, and then super wideband um, next to it. So there's this, a, a gradual progression as to how much more information that you deliver, um, the better the codecs get. Now, since we talked about HD, we're going to try delivering it. To be married to a VoIP geek is not that bad. I have all my Friday evenings to myself. I can go out, have a drink, see my girlfriends. Then I come home, I cook a nice dinner, and I wait until the conference is over, just hoping my dinner won't be totally burnt. Okay, now what you actually heard, the first third of that um, audio clip, of that audio clip was um, narrowband, the second third was um, G722 HD voice, and then the finishing part was super wideband in uh, G722.1C, one of the uh, Polycom Siren um, codecs. Now, as you could tell from a subjective viewpoint, um, the biggest jump in clarity is from when you go from G711 up to G722, and then you got a further improvement once you went from G722 all the way up to um, uh, 7221C. Um, and the other thing that, that this clip and the other clip that I'm going to play illustrates quite clearly is that um, one of the benefits of HD voice is that if you're trying to interpret or listen to um, somebody who doesn't speak your own language, you get a, a, a clearer exam, a, you get a much more clearer understanding when you've got that extra audio information to play with in your head. So I'm going to play another contrast example. The other thing that happens in this contrast example is that as you're going from left to right, you can that there's a, a, a screen graph that's giving you the, the energy of or, or the amount of information being captured in Hertz that, that um, as it as it rolls across. Hi everyone. My name is Michael Edema from the Escozia PBX project. We're currently developing an asterisk-based firmware for low resource or embedded systems and currently importing from FreeBSD to Linux onto two different CPU architectures. So I'm unfortunately unable to attend this year. We're just a little bit backed up. I also have a cold, which you might be able to hear in exceptional quality right now. Uh, have a great time at Astrocon. We're going to be there next year. Bye-bye. So you kind of hear the difference between the, 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 the two or the three different samples. Um, but the benefits are, are, are there's, there's two major benefits for moving from narrowband to HD voice um, that a lot of people have been hyping about. First benefit is there's better compensation and better clarity. Um, when you compress something down into narrowband, that, that two point, um, that, you know, that, that, that chunk of narrowband, um, similar sounding words like sale and fail start to gap, um, start to garble. Um, and then you get, if you get into a situation where you're rattling off a lot of acronyms like FCC, FTC, things like that, those are notorious for getting garbled and you have to either spell them out or you have to repeat them. Um, in addition to that, um, as you kind of got the impression from the, the clips, narrowband is a big headache 
when you're in a multilingual setting, when you're trying to talk to somebody else that doesn't speak your own language and vice versa. Um, the second thing uh, with narrowband is reduction of fatigue. And this is also called why conference calls suck. Nobody, is anybody like conference call here? Anybody, we know. Nobody likes conference call. Well, there's a reason for that, and, and there's actually a physiological reason for that. Um, that narrowband clipping that you know we've all taken for granted means that um, in the background, your brain is playing fill in the back blank as a background task in your head to fill in the information between what you're hearing in narrowband and what it should sound like in, in wideband or if the guy was sitting right next to you. Um, the net net of this is the more audio data that you can deliver to the de to the ear, the less your brain has to compensate um, and figure out what somebody else is saying. Um, you know, so this is the reason why you don't look forward to conference calls, even though you don't realize it. Um, you know, your brain has to actually do some work other than sit there, or you can ignore the conference call and sit there anyways. But you know, if you're trying to listen in on a conference call, trying to interpret what somebody else is saying, you know, it's a pain in the ass. Um, delivering HD voice is more than just a codec. Um, you need to have a codec that can capture the sound, and um, a, you have to be able to have a software that, that moves that from point A to point B in, in terms of quality of service. You have to have the hardware that, that can actually capture that range of sound, a solid network. Um, and then if you're also trying to do this on a large scale, you have to have IP or SIP interoperability in order to move call from point A to point B. Um, so in most cases, um, Doing HD voice is an all IP or SIP application for the networks of the future, anything that we're talking about broadband, um, number one. Number two is that you do need more capable speakers and microphones um, on your phones um, because the audio PS can, you know, you just can't backfit that because, again, those parts are engineered to capture narrowband. They're not engineered to capture wideband sound. Um, again, you need good quality of service. You need low latency in the network. Basically, if you can't do vanilla VoIP in, in terms of quality, you aren't going to be able to do HD voice. Um, and then finally, for scaling, I'm going to get a little bit more into this um, um, further down in the presentation. You need to have agreements to interop or to interconnect via SIP for seamless HD calling. And then you also have to have a mechanism for transcoding. Um, so I'm going to walk through this. Um, one by one. HD voice codecs. There are four codecs kicking around that what I call the codecs that really matter. Um, the first codec that is the, the gold standard or the old standard depending upon how you feel is called G722. Um, basically it was uh, developed in the 80s. Um, the patents have expired on it. Now anybody can use it. Now everybody does use it um, if they're building um, IP phones these days. Um, the next codec is called AMR wideband or also G722.2. Now the cellular industry over in Europe wanted a, a um, codec based on their original AMR codec standards. Um, now, the reason why they wanted AMR, wide, AMR wideband is that it was designed to, to conserve uh, usage of radio frequency. Um, so you could basically put an HD call into about 24 kilobits a second versus the 64 kilobits a second you need with G722. Um, the downside to AMR wideband is that you need to pay VoiceAge and Motorola and France Telecom and Ericsson for patent use if you, if you actually put it into a handset. Um, right now, AMR wideband is currently exclusively in a cellular domain, but um, some of the, the patent holders of AMR wideband want to see that codec move into wireline. Um, there's a big push on it. The third codec of note is called ISAC. Um, ISAC um, uh, was a, a codec um, that's been developed by uh, Global IP Solutions or GIPS. Now Google turned around and paid $68 million for GIPS back in May. Um, ISAC is licensed for practically nearly every software client um, on the planet to deliver voice, including AOL, Yahoo, uh, Nimbus, WebEx, uh, Citrix Online, IBM's Lotus. The big question right now is if um, Google will take that um, ISAC Kodak and open source it or and or open source other Kodaks within the GIPS family um, like it did with, like um, Google has done with the um, video codecs that it's bought and um, as open source. Now finally, kind of like the dark horse in this race is uh, uh, Silk. Um, Skype wanted a super wideband codec, something to brag about, uh, with had, which had variable bitrate adaptability based upon the CPU you had and the network that you have. Um, it's got a royalty free license and then it samples anywhere between 8 and 24 kilohertz and uses anywhere from 6 to 40 kilobits a second for bandwidth to deliver a call. Um, 
Skype wanted something that could run on older computers as well as run on the latest and greatest computers and, and to run in a, a wide range of um, uh, bandwidth availability. So to handle anything from, you know, dial up all the way up to um, the latest and greatest uh, fiber connections. But everybody wants to do codecs, so there's more codecs. Uh, Polycom has a whole host of codecs, like the one that we heard, G722.1, the Polycom Siren codec, um, that's royalty free. Um, You've got a Frauenheimer Audio Communications Engine, or ACE. Um, the, the people who gave us MP3 are also pushing um, uh, an a, 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 the AAC codec um, for uh, delivering HD voice. But of course, if you get it and implement it, you have to pay royalties on it. Uh, SpeechX is an open source codec that's been floating around, and, and people give lip service to that. And finally, uh, Broadcom has released a bunch of codecs for its chipset. This is significant because um, a lot of phones use the Broadcom, Broadcom parts. Um, so why do people fight over codecs? Well, number one, developers, all programmers think they can write something better. Um, if you look at it from a hardware perspective, um, you know, simpler is better. From a hardware perspective, if you're building a phone or you're trying to do an implementation, the fewer codecs are, the, are better um, because you have less expense to test and verify and support codecs. So hardware guys, they want as few codecs as possible. Um, and on the device side, especially more with mobile devices, the less processing you do in the phone, you, the longer battery life that you get. Common sense. Um, the wireless crowd, um, they have a different view. Um, the wireless crowd likes to lean on the device CPU in order to do uh, data compression. So, you, so that includes things like AMR wideband and SILP. Um, that's because the old guard in the wireless crowd believes that every little RF bandwidth is sacred. Um, you know, and you need to conserve bandwidth um, uh, with, within, uh, within licensed bands. The problem is that, that that statement goes out the door when you start talking about 3G networks and 4G networks where you know, a 64 kilobit setup for a voice call is nothing. And you know, still carriers say a straight, you know, carriers and people pushing AMR wideband say with a straight face that um, yeah, we need concern bandwidth all the while they're rolling out streaming video services and two-way video services. It's like, you know, give me a break. Um, finally, when you get to network core, the guys that are switching phone calls back and forth on the service providers, uh, you know, you have more codecs, you have to do more transcoding. And again, it becomes a support issue. It's a pain in the ass to do. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, service providers want to avoid transcoding because it does cost them money for, you know, because either they have to buy bigger boxes to do trans more, to support more codecs for transcoding. Um, and then the other concern is that um, you lose some HD voice goodness. Um, when you translate, you may lose some HD voice goodness if you translate between one HD voice codec into another HD voice codec. Um, as a side note, the cable companies and France Telecom are embracing a standard called CAT IQ, which doesn't have to do transcoding at all. They've got a, a, there's some standards floating around that allow you to do end-to-end -end, um, an end-to-end -end call in G722, um, where both sides can even be on a wireless handset. So that's pretty cool. Um, software clients and hardware. You know, again, um, if you, you have a soft client you download, there's plenty of them floating around that support G722, or they already have ISAC already built in. Um, and then, of course, there's one big one, Stripe, that already supports Silk. Um, Hardware-wise, if you buy an IP desktop handset today from any of the name manufacturers, and even from a lot of the no-name manufacturers um, from, from China and, and, and things like that, They've all got G722 built in as uh, support. You know, for them, it's a it's a relatively cheap thing to throw in, um, in, in terms of throwing the Kodak in. But the the flip side of that is some of these guys advertising that they support HD voice may not have the good acoustics that is the higher quality microphones and speakers in order to deliver that that full experience of sound. Now, on the mobile device side, it's a little bit more interesting. You do need uh, uh, good acoustics. Um, so you need a little bit better uh, microphone or you need to, um, but one of the other things that's happening is um, phone manufacturers are starting to stick in dual microphones into handsets so they can do things like um, echo cancellation or noise cancellation to, to, to get a clearer um, uh, voice. So how do you get HD voice users um, 
to talk to other HD voice users. How do you get these guys to talk to the PSTN? After all, the PSTN is not going away tomorrow. Um, the simplest case is if you have the same codec type when you're trying to make a phone call. And if you're on the same LAN or network, as many of you may find if you're at a higher, if you're at, you know, if you're at a college or university or your business uses it, um, if you're all on the same network, you're all using the same codec, you're all behind the same firewall, you can just call John over in the next office, or you can call Bob upstairs, and it just happens. The problem is when you start to move beyond um, the DMARC in your firewall, or the DMARC at a, or move at, at, you know, where the security barrier is at a service provider, and then after that things get to be a lot trickier because there has to be a more formalized negotiation for security reasons. Okay. Now, for different codec types, we also have to get into things like transcoding, where you, where you go from either HD voice to the PSTN, um, and it's kind of accepted. Everybody realizes, again, the normal phone system isn't going to go away anytime in the next decade, so you need to be able to downshift from wideband down to narrowband. That's easy enough to do. Um, the, the thing that gets upset is that if you do have to touch the PSTN, you lose all that goodness of the HD call in the first place because you're basically cutting out all that sound not really a, a, a net gain there. But secondly, and the thing that, that's getting people to gnash their teeth a little bit more is when you have to translate between G722 to AMR wideband, um, service providers get a little bit annoyed, but not really, because they accept the need to translate between HD codecs, i.e. like G722, which is already there, and AMR wideband, you know, on the mobile side. Now, HD voice in the island problem. If you want to scale up, um, you need to be able to interconnect um, at the IP level via SIP to have a seamless end-to-end -end SIP call anywhere on the internet or anywhere on a broadband network. Now, the thing is that service providers don't do SIP tiering, IP interconnection, federations, whatever you want to call it, out of the box. Now, why don't they do that? Well, there are a hell of a lot of security considerations when you start um, talking about um, VoIP. You've got SPIT, you've got DDoS, you know. <laughs> Go back through uh, DEF CON for the last five years and dig out everything that, you know, all the security headaches that, that you can find with VoIP, and there's the argument. A um, the second headache is that ENOM, that is translating between the normal 10 digit phone system on the PSTN um, and mapping that to a, a phone call, um, that gets to be a little bit of a headache. There's a quality of service issue because service provider A wants to make sure if they make a phone call to service provider B, it goes through with high quality of service. That has to be negotiated at a, at a higher level. Um, and then finally, there's an argument as well, if I, I place a call this way, who gets the money? Um, now, as a result of that, of all these of the security issues involved, there are a lot of many, there are a lot of HD voice islands running around within enterprises as well as at service providers. So the, the task of the day um, for HD voice to move forward is building HD voice bridges building all these interconnects um, between everybody doing HD voice. There's three ways to do this. You can peer, you can have a direct relationship between a service provider and a service provider um, and, and build a trusted relationship where you two, ex where you know, comp service provider A and service provider B um, can do that. Um, number two is you can interconnect, interconnect or federate with a third party um, in a spoken hub network fashion with, with whoever your hub service is, handling all that overhead of enum, SIP, the technical issues, some of the business issues and legal issues involved in terms of exchanging SIP. And then finally, um, the third solution that's just come out um, recently is you can buy a box from Cisco if you happen to have a Cisco product, um, and you can interconnect automatically with this, with this Cisco IME box. Um, SIP federations, um, there are like two major players in the SIP um, federation um, uh, club right now. Number one is a company called XConnect based over in London. Um, they've been running an HD voice trial um, for IP interconnect um, basically uh, since the uh, April of this year. Um, the trial's still going on. Um, the problem that they seem to have is they haven't made a, a big value statement or a value proposition to a lot of folks as to why people should pay money to subscribe to their service. The problem right now is that there are a lot, a lot of little guys that can do HD calls, but if I have to pay a couple thousand bucks a month for that service, that's a lot of money when I'm only going to have a low probability for an HD voice call to go from point A to point B cleanly. 
So there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem there. Um, the second guy, that, the second people that could do SIP interconnect if they woke up and do it is a Sprint. Sprint's got the PIN network, and that's not no Candace Bergen dropping a PIN. That's the partner inner exchange network. Um, they built a um, an architecture that can handle a full range of uh, rich media uh, SIP stuff. Um, but right now, the only service they're running over it is uh, Venal VoIP. And part of the problem is right now they're in the mindset that they're treating us just like a regular voice call when they when they terminate calls. So they want a price per minute on the call and they want termination fees. And you know that doesn't really work in a VoIP world where you know all you do is you plug in the uh, in the you plug in the giggy Ethernet and it just happens. Now the third thing, uh, third way to do it is, is Cisco's got a, a product out called the Intercompany Media Engine. Has anybody heard of that? No? Okay. Um, SIP, uh, Cisco basically built this magic box to get around get around the issue of having to have service providers or large enterprises directly peer with each other. Um, basically, there's an appliance that you plug in, you load into this appliance all your SIP devices that have phone numbers, and that can be HD voice phones, regular IP phones, that could be the video, the cutesy video phones. Uh, that can even be telepresence rooms. You load all of the phone numbers in, into their magical box and you turn it on. And what the magical box does is talk to all the other IME boxes. Well, it talks to a, um, first of all, it talks to a, a dynamic hash table and publishes all those phone numbers that have been entered into it into a, into a large dynamic hash table that's capable of handling up to 10, 10 billion entries, a lot of phone numbers. Um, and then what happens is these boxes just sit there until somebody from another, um, also that owns this, another Cisco IME box, the two call each other and then um, with a regular phone call. And after that first regular phone call, um, they take the information from that regular PSTN based phone call and they, they, they you know, like length of call, um, you know, when it started, when it stopped, and they, they, they treat that as a shared secret. And then the two Cisco IMEs wake up and go, why, you have HD, and yes, I have HD, and, they, and then they exchange security information, and, they, and, uh, and then subsequent calls, after they exchange security information, then, then the, the IMEs know that, hmm, if this phone number is called, I can just route that straight over the internet, and then subsequent calls after that get routed on a, a virtual SIP trunk that gets um, set up each time a phone call is made. Um, and again, any calls made in that fashion can be anything from um, vanilla VoIP, HD voice, video, or anything else that you can do that's SIP based. Now, the IME engine is also interesting because if you look at um, all the standards that Cisco's proposed, um, some of those standards were, were written um, by a former Skype employee, so you see where that whole peer to peer architecture comes into play and why it comes into play. Um, realistically, though, the biz biz uh, biggest headaches for HD bridges are layers 8 and 9. Layer 8 is money. Layer 9 is politics. Um, in layer 8, we need to start talking about money. Um, you know, voice providers are used to terminating calls on a, uh, are used to getting paid for termination and on a per minute basis for long distance calls. And whenever you start talking flat rate to the local, to, to your phone company, they start to tilt a little bit. They just, um, They've reluctant, you know, a lot of phone companies reluctantly, you know, they will do flat rate plans, um, but, you know, you dig a little bit harder and, and there are certain services where they, they, they still do termination calls and, and per minute charges. Now, service providers are reluctant to pay the upgrade for infrastructure, that is pay for a Cisco ME box or pay for, or, or pay for the overhead to negotiate peer-to-peer um, -peer, um, exchanges with other service providers um, because it's currently a very small universe um, of uh, phones that make HD calls, but that number is growing every day. Um, and then interesting though, Verizon Business has, has decided to provide free SIP calling in its Viper service um, to its customers. Um, now layer nine in politics, um, there's a lot of jockeying going on by smaller players that want to get together and peer and so they can build up their own big um, universes. Uh, to exchange uh, uh, VoIP calls directly bypassing the PSTN and yes, directly bypassing the old style termination per minute charges. Um, the larger players are moving slower to IP interconnect. Um, it's on their radar, but you know it's not on their, their list of things to do because once they implement that, that regime, then that starts cutting into the bottom line that they're making from um, settlements and termination. Um, you'll probably, we'll see the cable companies start to do um, 
uh, IP interconnections next year so they can exchange uh, VoIP calls. Applications that love HD voice, um, conferencing is a killer app. Again, there's clarity, there's less stress, you can identify voices, accents are much less of a barrier. Um, when you get into multinational conversations, that's a bonus dollars. Because again, with non-native speakers of different languages, you can better understand what somebody's saying and you can better understand what's being said um, when you start to throw accents in. Um, and, and third, the other application that loves HD voice is transcriptions. When you go for things from, from like voice to email, um, if you're using computer-based or human-based things to do transcription, um, HD voice gives you, um, um, it's easier process, there's less errors, so HD is a big win there. Applications that should love HD voice is anything to do with processing voice like IVR services and stuff like that. Um, the young and old. Um, if you've ever made a phone call to anybody under the age of three and you, you just hear the squeaky little voice on the other end and you go, uh, let me talk to your mommy, and then, okay, what did she say again? Um, the problem is that narrowband, you can't understand what kids stay in narrowband because they have that higher pitched voice. Um, and then, you know, if they're speaking and all their energy is up here and that narrowband's down here, you don't understand what the hell they're saying. Um, and again, if you're older, um, HD voice adds in that extra um, information so you can understand what they're saying better. Uh, public security, national defense, there's been an argument that if we, we if HD voice is implemented, um, you get better 911 calling um, rather than trying to figure out what somebody's saying in a panicked voice, a high-pitched voice. Um, and there's also been uh, some suggestion that if you put in HD, uh, there's better translation and understanding of intercepts. Um, yes, this is one area where we do want the enemy to have the latest and greatest technology so we can understand them better. Um, who is doing HD voice? Well, there's a lot of people and a lot of players on the service provider side. You have major telecom carriers, the mobile carriers, cables and MSOs are doing some work, uh, hosted uh, VoIP guys, um, and even smaller consumer plays. And then we'll get into by region. Uh, major telecom carriers uh, for broadband HD voice solutions. Uh, in broadband, France Telecom is the loudest guy. They've got half a million endpoints turned up as HD voice right now. Um, Verizon's got about um, 5,000 endpoints internally, and then Verizon Business is going to start supporting HD voice um, through their uh, VoIP Enterprise Exchange service um, by the end of this year. They're basically they're testing it out now. They probably have some guinea pigs um, in, in a couple of their favored um, uh, customers already. Uh, BT, uh, the BT Hub service is a G722 uh, service. Does anybody have a, a BT Hub? No? Um, you know, BT Hub is a HD voice service. It's just the Brits don't know what the hell to call it, so they call it like high definition voice, something weird. But it's not, they don't call it HD voice like everybody else does. Um, Telstra has a hosted HD voice service um, for businesses down under. In addition to that, um, Telstra has up to 11,000 endpoints using HD voice internally. Um, they're probably, at one point, they were the biggest single. Um, uh, carrier using HD voice, that's probably starting to shift a little bit as Verizon and other folks get traction. Um, Global Crossing, as I, I mentioned before, they're doing some stuff in HD voice for their um, high-end customers. Now, there are other carriers that have been rumored to do HD voice on the uh, broadband side. Uh, Telecom Italia, some of the Nordic telecoms. Um, in addition to that, there's, there's been a, a, a rumor that I haven't been able to confirm that AT&T um, is running HD voice trials down in uh, San Antonio in their... In their um, home headquarters, but AT&T isn't commenting and I can't find anybody who's got a phone in their um, house down there. Can't find a friend down in San Antonio, basically. Um, mobile cellular um, for HD voice. Um, what's happening is uh, the positioning is if you're running a 3G plus service um, or running Volga voice over uh, LTE or 4G, these are all going to be drivers for HD voice, higher quality voice services. There's kind of a recognition among the cellular carriers that uh, voice quality among the cellular carriers suck. And, um, you know, France Telecom in, in, in their orange brand has been a very aggressive in pushing um, HD voice. Um, they've already rolled out service in Moldova and Armenia. Um, France is supposed to be done by the end of July, that is now. Um, they've been doing trials in the UK for HD voice, and the rollout is expected later, um, later this summer. Um, and in addition to that, um, FT has also said that they're going to turn up HD voice mobile service in Belgium, Luxembourg, and Spain by the end of this year. Um, and then you can throw in Tunisia on that as well. 
Why Tunisia? Well, um, the pattern is that um, France Telecom spends a lot of money deploying what they call these 3G networks or advanced mo mobile networks out there. Um, and basically, um, again, Moldova, Armenia, Tunisia, they're all greenfield builds. There's no legacy equipment in there. Um, France Telecom just rolls out the latest and, and greatest equipment in there, the most modern switches. Once they turn up all that stuff, all you need to do is have an HD phone on, have a mobile handset that supports HD um, in that network, and you've got HD, you know, basically for the cost of turning up the network. Um, so um, in Tunisia, um, they, uh, Orange France Telecom has invested up to half a billion euros to build out this uh, 3G plus network. So, if you're going to build a network with that expensive, it you know it goes to assume that they're going to stick HD on it. Um, SFR um, is testing in France now, and they expect um, I expect to shoot HP shortly. Um, uh, 3UK has demoed HD Voice, um, and then Deutsche Telekom has trialed HD voice on LTE. They did it sometime in the past two years. They haven't um, put their cards on the table yet, but it's pretty sure that when the time comes, probably when there are more um, phone uh, mobile handsets in the pipeline, they'll probably uh, turn up HD voice somewhere or another. Uh, cables and MSOs, you know, I, I hate to quote Battlestar Galactica, well, the Cylons have a plan. Well, cable has a plan. And Cable's plan is basically, um, they've issued multiple standards relating to HD voice to implement it. Um, they issued both a, an IP interconnect standard and a, the DEC CAT IQ standard where you can do end-to-end -end, um, calls between point A and point B um, for HD voice. Um, in addition to that, Cablevision, kind of like the bleeding edge guys in cable, they, they've got a hosted HD voice uh, service turned up now. Um, Cox, all they'll say is they'll, they're looking at turning up HD voice in 2011. Uh, Comcast, um, their CTO has basically dropped the, uh, uh, said that as the company moves to HD voice, when they, they start moving phone calls off the regular phone system, they're going to turn up HD, but then when you, any follow-ups to Comcast are like, well, we're not going to comment at this time. So being, they were being real assholes about it. I mean, basically, their CTO has talked about it, but they're not going to put a timetable out there. Um, and then Time Warner Cable has, has tested HD voice in their labs. And then every time you try to pin them down on a deployment date, they, they go, well, you know, within five years. But they won't, they, they just won't, you know, they just don't want to put their cards on the table. And for all the cable companies, they want, that all of them see money out of the enterprise. They're kind of like maxed out residential or they milk the residential. So they see HD and, and, all, and also just businesses, making money off the businesses. Um, uh, so they want to do, um, so as they deploy SIP trunking and more hosted services for businesses, you're going to see HD roll out as a part of that package. Business VoIP providers, there's a lot of independent hosted providers in North America. They've been doing HD voice for a couple of years just to differentiate themselves against uh, the Verizons and the AT&Ts of the world. Um, 8x8, um, you'll find them in uh, Staples. You can walk into Staples and buy an 8x8 phone and service. Um, they're the biggest guys in North America doing HD right now. Um, they've got, AS they use Astra phones, um, IP phones. Uh, right now, they've got between 130,000, 130, uh, 140,000 endpoints deployed. You know, by the end of June, uh, there are numerous little guys with uh, anywhere from 2,500 to 7,500 endpoints doing HD around the country. Um, and then there's also been a lot of talk, and I think some of it's just smack talk among the smaller guys for basically getting together and, and peering all their IHP, all their IP phone numbers, so they can deliver HD voice and other services. Um, there was uh, last fall there was an IP peering alliance press release about how a, a group of bold and brave, you know, independent VoIP providers would all get together, and the one press release came and they haven't done dick. And then this. Um, uh, later, uh, earlier this spring, then there was an announcement from a, a cloud communications alliance, which seems to be a more formal group of the IP peering people. They've said, well, we're all going to get together and we're going to do all these wonderful things and then we're going to build this whole huge HD voice, um, you know, interconnect. Uh, and you haven't heard anything out of them since. Um, so, digging through a little bit more, um, Half the guys that are in the XConnect trial belong to the IP Peering Alliance, um, and they've also tried to do some interconnections with uh, Broadsoft. Um, independent consumer plays. Um, there's a, a couple of people um, in, that are doing HD voice in the consumer world. UMA's, you've probably heard the UMA commercials. Um, the UMA second generation Tello hardware both supports uh, G722 as well as the CAT IQ wireless HD voice standard. 
Um, in the fourth quarter of 2009, uh, UMA shipped 25,000 units. Uh, you do the math conservatively, UMA could ship up to 100, could have deployed up to 125,000 units um, doing HD voice by the end of 2010. But, um, you know, UMA was very, very rah rah HD voice initially. This year, they earlier in the spring, they took a left turn and they started talking about great voice quality, you know, narrowband. And it's just like, guys. Um, now, the guys that do the did the Ojo phone, Worldgate, um, they also come out with a uh, second generation video phone. Um, and they've got this two year, 300,000 unit deal to ship video phones to ACN. And gee, as, it supports both, uh, you know, video, but it also supports G722. HD voice by region, um, as noted, uh, Europe led by France Telecom. Um, you're starting to see a lot of movement there. Asia, Austria, Australia, not Austria, and Telstra are offering hosted service right now. Korea and Japan are offering HD voice services, but it's hard to tell what once you translate stuff through Google. And then again, in North America, you've got a lot of stuff going on under the radar. And then finally, uh, Africa and South America, if you're talking about greenfield rollouts of 3G, 4G networks, they're going to have good potential to have HD voice just tagging along. Um, drivers for the HD voice today, I'll flip through this real quick. Service providers like HD because there's an attraction there. Um, France Telecom, um, there are in services like Experience and Motion, um, and it also allows them to showcase the latest and greatest technology that they've got. Um, they're also thinking that they've got a better quality product. It keeps people from switching to another service. Um, France Telecom's not charging extra for broadband HD. Um, now, the big question for service providers, well, how do we make money on HD? Nobody knows. There's, on, there's one possibility is that um, in a prepay versus postpay world, um, in a prepay world, you might just get a PS10 quality voice. In a postpaid world, that is where you hand larger checks to the phone company on a regular basis, um, HD voice might be the quality of service. You know, HD voice is something you might have to pay for and sign up for on a, on a regular contract. But nobody knows. Again, conferencing HD voice is killer app because you get clear information. It's less stressful. Multinational, again, um, I'll flip to this. Uh, don't care about UC. There are a lot of people in higher ed um, like to play with cool toys. And um, so there's, there, you're starting to see large deployments of, of HD in uh, places like Penn State and Texas Tech. Uh, who companies in the HD ecosystem? Again, you got people like, yeah, I'm bleeding. Um, H, you got BT, Cablevision, France Telecom, Verizon Business, 8x8. Um, all the IP desk hand, handset manufacturers do HD voice today. Um, with mobile handset man manufacturers, both Nokia and uh, Sony Ericsson um, are supporting HD voice on uh, France Telecom's network today. Um, all the other phone manufacturers are in the pipeline to support HD voice. LG is probably one of them. Basically, if you went to, to France Telecom's website and looked at all the vendors supplying um, them phones today, they're probably going to be supporting HD voice by the end of 2011 because France Telecom, they want HD on all their phones by the end of 2011. Um, and, you know, you got people like Cisco, Dialogic, Ericsson supporting um, HD at the network core as well. Okay, so how does this all roll out around the world? Um, macro picture of HD voice today. There's a lot of technology. Technology is out there in abundance. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's already out there. And as I noted before, there's a lot of HD um, islands out there at enterprises and smaller service providers, and, and soon larger service providers are going to get turned on to HD, like Verizon Business is turning on their service. There's a lot of HD islands out there. Um, so in the near term, IP interconnect um, is coming. The hurdle is getting past, again, layers eight and nine, the money and the politics issues. People need to figure out how they're going to make money or how they're going to save money doing HD. Number one. Number two, they need to get past the politics of, well, how do I screw Bob or, you know, or I can connect to Bob and it's not going to hurt me. They have to get through that mindset. Longer term, um, you'll hear about super wideband coming along as a codec or CPE upgrade. And the reason why is, well, the, the question in my mind is, are people going to um, push for super wideband or not? And, and the answer is, who the hell knows? We've sat around since 1937 with narrowband voice, and we're just getting around to upgrading to um, HD. Super wideband may take us another 20 years. It may not, because upgrading a super wideband is just a codec and a, an end uh, an end uh, end user uh, hardware. So you look overseas. Mobile HD voice is going to happen happen faster. The reason why is a typical handset 
um, life cycle is about you know three years plus minus. Uh, Japan slightly faster. Um, in the U.S., a little bit more, um, yeah, but it's an arms race. You know, these guys make money off of selling handsets. So, plug in an HD, plug it into uh, uh, mics. That's that's the latest and greatest stuff. So, the more features that they can add, and the more that faster processors help them, the more they can do um, HD. Um, broadband. Broadband. The most interesting part about talking about broadband is that. Um, Verizon, um, it basically is going to boil down to Verizon versus AT&T, um, who, who blinks first. Cable companies are on their little path to, to you know, have HD voice generally available both for residences and for businesses and probably residences in the 2011-2012 time frame. And, and, and the general consensus is, is that once one large carrier like a Comcast or Time Warner does it, everybody else is going to have to have it because they have to be like the Joneses. Okay, so for more HD voice information, you can visit the website, find the presentation on there, on, uh, on, on uh, WWHD Voice News, um, and there's, there's some other resources as well um, floating around. But uh, contact me, but anybody got any questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, the U.S. cellular companies are just so hard to figure out. Um, there's this, you know, I would say that um, as soon as they figure out how to do VoIP over LTE, HD will come shortly after because then it's just a codec thing. You know, there's all, and all this gnashing about uh, Volga, you know, doing voice over LTE, and, you know, they just established those standards. Um, you know, I'd say probably, you know, no earlier than 2011. It'll be 2011, 2012. Um, but I think, you know, but basically, if you're going to do VoIP, um, it, it, you know, from a purist standpoint, from a, from a supported standpoint, if you're going to do VoIP, then you might as well do HD. Now, I can turn that on its head, and I can go over the top. If I've got a, if I've got a 3G or 4G phone, like an Android phone, then I can load in, a, you know, I can load in something like SipDroid or a SIP client, and then you and I could just talk. But for gen from, from a generally uh, from from a GA perspective, generally available perspective, it's probably like 20 late 2011, 2012. At well, I, I you know. Everybody wants to move to do SIP peering. Well, it's complicated. They're, they're, the cable industry in general is starting to move to more federated model and using all SIP. You know, right now they just exchange calls and they do settlements. You know, but but more and more, but but that gets to be more and more problematic because everybody's got a flat rate plan these days, unless and, and you know unless you're doing on a prepay basis. So, other questions? No? Well, have a good one. I'm getting off the stage. Thank you very much.